mentioned, I'm Mike Morley and I'm uh, one of the founders of Menome Technologies. And I'm very honored to speak to you this morning on a, on a subject that um, it's, it's, it's a fairly challenging subject, uh, but one that I've, I feel that is very important for us to speak about and, and to reflect on. And my presentation does build a bit on the themes that Yichel uh, spoke about yesterday, which I, it was a great keynote and I appreciate your, your thoughts. <laughs> um, so, but I will be speaking about some experiences that I've had, um, which I haven't talked about in public before. And they were fairly painful experiences, um, but they did give me and have given me a unique uh, insight on this whole issue of uh, values and the, and the way leadership works and the interaction between leadership and culture um, and the things that we are currently seeing in, in the technology industry today. Um, I do feel that very strongly that we are at a turning point in the evolution of our industry and we as practitioners need to explore and discuss these challenges. And so I hope uh, to harness some of these experiences that I'm going to tell you about um, as an illustration of the impacts of leadership gone wrong in a culture that sort of started off with one set of intentions and ended up in a, in a very, very different place um, through a whole series of, of, of steps, which I'll, which I'll speak about. And then if we have a bit of time, although I, I don't actually know how long this thing is, because <laughs> it, it keeps evolving. Every day there's, there's new material that comes up. Um, but I'm hoping to have a bit of a discussion about this uh, at the end. All right, so a bit of background. Um, I began my career in uh, information technology in 1981 when, oops, when my parents bought me this Apple II computer, which we still have at the office and still works. Um, I had my first uh, programming job with a company called Perry Supply when I was 14, uh, writing uh, some software that helped them out with their accounting stuff. Um, and then I went on to do, uh, I went on to sell uh, Commodore 64s and Vic 20s. I sold 926 of them through, uh, through parts of high school. And that ended up getting me a job at a, a, a startup called Computrain, which you see over here. Um, so I was teaching computers and stuff in, in uh, in high school. As, and at that time, uh, the future of technology was, was virtually limit, limitless. So that's a picture of me in the middle there, my fantastic 1980s style bull cut. Um, <laughs> there, there was no downside. We didn't see a downside to any of this stuff. What could possibly go wrong? There was nothing we couldn't do with tech, nothing that couldn't be solved. Tech was it. Tech was going to revolutionize society and make it better for everyone. Now, there's not a day that goes by, including this morning, uh, where I was reading, catching up a bit on the news, where there isn't an article or a story about how technology companies are abusing employees, leaking data, Facebook leaked more data this week, turning their customers into digital addicts, building various different types of surveillance systems. Um, this was this morning, this came up, so Brad Smith from Microsoft has just published a book and is now on a speaking tour talking about how organizations are considering and looking at uh, building lethal autonomous weapons. Um, and while there are se se several large notable offenders that are being targeted by antitrust investigations and whatnot, uh, the crisis of culture and technology and its impacts on society are much broader than just these few organizations. Even formerly strong advocates, and this is, I don't know if you're familiar with Gerald Lanyard, but he was one of the visionaries in the 1980s that inspired me to go into technology, uh, kind of came up with the concept of virtual reality and whatnot, but they, he is now on speaking tours talking about this uh, and how um, technology and the impacts that it's had on society, and he's become very dis disillusioned with how this is, has transpired. Um, so what happened? Uh, how have we have an industry come to this point of what is a crisis of culture? Um, my feeling is that if we seek to understand how we got to where we are, through that understanding we can strive to make things better. So in order to explore how technology has lost its way, um, and it, I'm going to draw from some personal experiences that provide me with a bit of insight uh, into how an organization whose stated purpose was to make the, the people that, it, who's, including myself, who were in its care, um, better people and whatnot, how they lost their way. And to do that, I am going to tell you the story of how the, the um, public or the private boarding school that I went to came to use practices derived from a mind control cult. Um, so as I mentioned, when I was in high school, uh, I um, was not only working part-time at CompuTrain, I was also spending much of my time, uh, oops, I was supposed to go, okay. 
I was spending much of my time working on a bulletin board system, which was, uh, for those of you who may or may not remember this, was a, a sort of a precursor to all the online communities we see today with uh, things like Facebook and whatnot. Um, so I co-authored this thing with, with Wayne, who you see up there, and we worked on it from 1982 through to about 1986. And by the time it went offline in 1987, we had about four different systems running in several hundred users, which was a pretty impressive accomplishment for the day. So by 1986, I was putting nearly all my time into, into that system. And I was also writing ticket management systems for um, a local theater company, consulting for CompuTrain. Um, I built a video rental management system. For those of you who don't remember, there used to be things called videotapes that you had to go to a place and rent. Fortunately, our friends at Netflix um, <laughs> solved that problem for us. <laughs> um, so anyway, I was spending so much time doing this. It was great. It made me a fantastic software developer, but it had some pretty negative impacts on my marks. Uh, my marks sort of went from being top of class to being not so good. Um, so in order to get me into, and this jeopardized my chances of going to uni university, and I really wanted to go to Waterloo, where I ended up going eventually. But um, so what we had to do is we, my, my parents and I talked about this, and we're like, okay, we'll find a boarding school, and we'll send you a way to get you away from these evil computer things. Um, which we did. So uh, my, my parents come from a fairly religious background. My grandfather here was the primate out of the Anglican Church of Canada, and my mom is an ordained priest in the Anglican Church. Um, so we looked around for a school that reflected the values of the Anglican Church, which are fairly moderate and, and very liberal. Um, that's the ordained uh, woman priest. Um, so we found this Grenville Christian College, which looked to fit all the bills. You know, it was a it was an Anglican school, um, and it had a, a, a great campus, and from the outside it looked very impressive when we toured it and whatnot, and the brochures and everything. Um, sports teams, programs, all kinds of great stuff. And of course it had this goal, um, to make students the best people they could be by generating a true sense of honesty, by getting the students to live up to a code of ethics, and the desire to live integrity through inst instilling a sense of, I think they used the word righteousness. <laughs> that should have been a signal. Um, unfortunately, there was a dark side to this school that was not evident from its clean, well-kept campus and tuned marketing message and apparently moderate religious values. So this past week, I was in Toronto. Um, what happened was the school had, uh, had a charismatic leader that, that came into this thing. And he brought the philosophy and technique, and I'm going to talk a, lot, a bit about technique and what that is and what the implications of it are. Um, he brought the techniques from a thing called the Community of Jesus, which is still an active organization in the United States, and it's a known uh, religious cult. Um, he brought these techniques in and applied them to the staff at the school in order to, tr to, to, bring their, uh, to bring them up to what he saw as being the living to this code of ethics. And the idea was is that true honesty and integrity could only be derived from being obedient and subjugated. Um, and obedient and subjugated to the leader who was the representative of God. Um, and that anything that interfered with your relationship with God had to be eliminated. Um, which the system was designed to break down people's spirits, their individuality, and their autonomy. And the technique here used was known as a light session. Um, and the goal of this light session process was to make transgressions public um, and therefore help write out sin, bring all this thing out into the open so that everybody would know about the transgressions you had made. So this um, started off and sort of uh, started off with just the staff and whatnot, but was eventually adopted into the overall culture of the school um, and was applied to the student body as a whole. And this eventually led to the school closing and most recently a lawsuit. So I attended the first part of the lawsuit, uh, which is scheduled to run for the next five weeks. Uh, when I was in Toronto earlier this week. So I was there with my classmates and uh, listening to the testimony and so on. Um, so, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in terms of how it applies to the technology industry uh, and what we're seeing in the context of the leadership and whatnot uh, and how this whole thing kind of evolved from one state to another, the uh, state where it was not constructive. Um, Coming out of that experience of seeing and experiencing firsthand a culture that had become radicalized by our charismatic leader has set me on a course of trying to understand how this happens. Uh, and I can see parallels in the situation we find ourselves in uh, with technology companies and their leadership and their practices today. So my hope is to use this experience that I had, which was awful, 
Um, and I was subject to the light sessions. I was not subject to the deeper abuses that happened at the school that are part of the, the case. Um, so my hope is that we can understand these patterns and anti-patterns that manifest themselves uh, and create foundations for the next generation of organizations that come out from a cultural standpoint that prevent these sorts of things from emerging at all. And I have researched this subject fairly extensively um, over many years now, and, uh, and I've identified um, several key things that we need to explore on this front. Uh, here we go. So if it can be done, it should it be done. How far will I go to succeed? How far am I willing to follow a leader? So I'm going to step through each one of these questions and explore them a bit in some detail. <clears throat> if it can be done, should it be done? So oh, I have the book in my bag. I was supposed to hold it up and say, this is a book. <laughs> For those of you who have never seen a book, our friends at Amazon have made books go away. Um, <laughs> so this is a fascinating book. So this was written, uh, Jacques Allel is a French philosopher. Um, and this book was written in 1968. Ironically, it is not available electronically at all, even though it is called the Technological Society. Um, and it talks about this notion of technique. Uh, and technique is the whole complex of rationally ordered methods for making any human activity more efficient. So the key thing here is that technology is part of this whole techni technique thing. Um, but it, te technique itself includes other drivers that help bring the technology forward, which include business drivers, market, uh, market effects, philosophy, and personal objectives that are just left out of the technology piece, typically. Um, and it resonates because uh, it factors in all of these other things that, uh, that drive the technology into society and uh, help us deliver technology and whatnot. But the thing that Alol explores, and this is, like, this is a book that really any, everybody should read, but um, it's a fairly long one. So uh, the thing is, is that he explores in some detail is the fact that there's the thing that you're trying to accomplish in, t in terms of making things better and more efficient. But then there's all these secondary effects that are out there that you don't necessarily see while you're trying to accomplish the technical objective. And they can actually, in a lot of cases, be, be more disastrous than the lack of technique would have been. So, speaking about this in the Grenville case, um, confession is the typical standard used by most religions in which a person voluntarily confesses to a priest, a trusted person, uh, in order, uh, but that's a fairly slow process. So the thinking again at Grenville was, by, or the, with this technique of public confessions, um, if you make that public to the entire community, then you will be, uh, then people will be aware of this whole situation and therefore it will make it easier for everybody to kind of collectively live in the light, more efficient. Um, they took then the next step of that, and what they would do is, uh, by the time I got to the school, what they did was they would proactively accuse people of sins they may have, they thought they had, had, had done or were potentially going to do. So this has some interesting parallels that you had mentioned in uh, your presentation yesterday, where there's facial recognition technology being applied to criminals in order to identify other people who might be criminals. This is basically what these guys were doing. They would say, oh, what you do is you'd be going down the hallway, or in, in my case, I was in the library, and I, as I recall, it was something to do with a, a book that I was reading. And one of the uh, teachers took a, said, why are you reading that? Where did you get that from? And I said, well, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a Robertson Davies book. And of course, Robertson Davies is, I don't know if you're familiar with him, he's a Canadian author. But he has a, a, he has a Jungian philosophy, philosophical basis, which has a lot of things that weren't in alignment with the way this school happened to see things. So then it became, what they would do is they would surround you, the staff would surround you, and then they would start accusing you. They'd accuse you of the thing that they thought you were doing, and then there would all be all sorts of other accusations that'd be levied at you, and, and they would keep doing this until you broke, uh, until you were, you know, until you actually broke down, and then confessed whatever it was uh, you, they thought you were doing. This also was done on a mass scale at the school, where they would uh, bring us all down into the auditorium um, and keep us there at, at night, in the middle of the night, um, and the headmaster would then stand a student up once he came in and did his fire and brimstone thing. Um, he would then stand somebody up and accuse them of whatever he thought they were doing, and he would keep at that person until they brought in every, anybody else that, that he felt or they, that uh, was supposed to be complicit with this particular uh, thing that was going on. So again, we see these sorts of mechanisms going on 
with technology uh, in terms of the social media justice type things that are happening in the public shaming uh, that happens now on the internet. Um, so this whole thing, uh, it didn't start out that way. It started out in a place where they were trying to do good things and they ended up in a place where they were causing a lot of harm and damage to people. And it was this erosion of culture focused on the technique and the end objective to the exclusion of all else that got them to this place. We get, to, we rush, in a rush to get to somewhere, we lose sight of the consequences and impacts. So, and I think this is a really interesting quote, you know, because as a technical person, of course, um, I get a rush out of solving a technical challenge. When you see something that is technically sweet, you just go ahead and you do it and you argue about what to do about it only after you've had your success. Um, and the thing is, is that maybe in a smaller scale, this is not such a bad way to go about things, not thinking about the impacts. You know, if I'm just hacking on my, my Apple II back in the day, it's like, okay, well, not too many things can go wrong. Um, but if, it's, if it goes beyond you with scale, the consequences of a, uh, the negative impacts of a technique can become much greater. And this quote, of course, comes from Robert Oppenheimer. Um, that is the way that it was with the atomic bomb. Um, and this is another fantastic book. There's actually uh, the making of the atomic bomb is the, the precursor to this book. This one, though, so when that talks about the Manhattan Project and the dynamics that went into making that whole thing possible, this book then talks about the scientists who were involved in the Manhattan Project and then real, and sort of realizing once the immediate threat had gone away, what they had actually created and how the impacts to the world that, that were going to come out of that. And it goes then and starts to debate a lot of the, it, it actually discusses how the scientists were in, and uh, physicists and whatnot were trying to figure out how they could prevent this from, you know, destroying the world. Um, could I cause harm to others by what I'm doing? If it can be done, should it be done? Technologists, we as, we as developers and we as technical people are, uh, focus on our technical responsibility to know as much as possible, develop and deploy new technology as fast as possible. But the singular focus on technology and not considering the larger issues of technique and what the implications are beyond the immediate thing we're trying to accomplish can often uh, be left until too late. Now, um, and as software development tools and libraries and whatnot become more powerful, we can do amazing things. And it's now relatively easy just to download, you know, various machine learning modules and whatnot off the internet, uh, or off GitHub and so on, and put these things to use to accomplish an outcome. And they're incredibly useful. We use these sorts of things at Minome, of course, to do some of the work that we do. Um, but then you have to also start to think about what you're doing and what the goals are and what the other things that may come out of this are. Just because we can do something, should we? This is a really interesting example. Um, and I don't know if you're familiar with this particular developer. Um, brilliant, brilliant person, clearly. Uh, and I want to read you this, this little excerpt out of this, this article that's cited here where I got this, this from. And there's a whole bunch of articles on, on this particular case. <clears throat> After a couple of miles, Hotz lets go of the wheel and pulls the trigger on the joystick, kicking the car into self-driving mode. He does this as we head into an S-curve at 65 miles per hour. I say a silent prayer. Hotz shouts, you got this car, you got this. The car does, more or less, have it. It stays around the first bend. Near the end of the second, the Acura suddenly veers towards an SUV on the right. I think of my soon-to-be fatherless children. The car corrects itself. Amazed, I ask Hotz what it felt like the first time he got the car to work. Dude, he says, the first time it worked was this morning. <laughs> now think about that. So, brilliant person, decides he doesn't like what Elon Musk is doing with the, the Tesla and it's too complicated, too many rules, takes too long, goes and uses his brilliant skills to hack his Acura, puts together his own self-driving car systems off, off parts he gets uh, uh, from assembling them together, um, and then takes it out on the road and starts testing it on a public highway. Now, I don't know about you, um, but I don't, you know, and I'm a pretty reasonable software developer, although <laughs> Mark and Conrad do uh, correct, have the, the joy of correcting some of my code because I'm sort of old these days, but um, I don't, you know, are you that confident in your, that your self-driving uh, self car control system is that good that it won't make a mistake and kill someone as you test it on a public highway? Where do you draw the line? 
regardless of the brilliance of the individual in question, is it really okay to test out a, a home-built self-driving car system and putting other people's lives at risk for your technical innovation? When you see something that is technically sweet, you go ahead and you do it and you argue about what to do it only after you've had your te technical success. What message does it send to society when we reward these sorts of behaviors? So this, this whole situation is written up and there's Anderson Horowitz is like, wow, this is amazing. We're going to give you all this money. You know, you should do more of this. Um, you know, and it was, it was sort of one thing when there was a clear delineation between a safety control system and software development. You know, if you're building an app or if you're, you know, whatever it happens to be, most of those things you used to be able to say, okay, well, this is, this is just a thing that's going to run on my phone, and if it screws up, who cares? This is a self-driving car, and it's on a highway, and if it screws up, people die. You know, there's a, this line has now been blurred, where the types of method, machine learning methodologies and whatnot are readily available, and they can be applied to things that... Um, we can use the same move fast and break things ethos with things that we probably shouldn't be. Um, and of course, the other thing that's interesting about this um, is what happens when brilliant people like, like this with this sort of a, a, you know, an, an attitude and a, a, an ethics foundation get into a large organization or get into a position of leadership. What happens when they are in charge of building something like, say, a plane? Um, now, you've probably all heard about this situation. Um, so I had the good fortune to speak with Matthew Oliver and uh, Paul Mann, who were members of the APEGA uh, Deputy Registrar and Chief Regu Regulatory Officer about ethics. So these, and these individual, uh, Matthew Oliver gave me these slides. He was involved in some of the, the aspects of the uh, investigation of this, uh, this plane. So um, it's really interesting. Uh, technique is the combination of technology, business practice, and market demand. In this case, the market demand for air travel, of course, is enormous. So the business demand required larger planes. Um, the issue in this case stemmed from the fact that in order to get the plane to market faster, instead of designing a new plane from the ground up, they took the 737 base platform, which was, has a stellar safety record and has been in service for a long time. And the short, to shortcut the cost of the designing this thing, um, they moved the engines forward to increase the capacity. And what that did is that reduced the inherent stability of the aircraft. So instead of saying, oh, wait a minute, this is a bad idea, they introduced another technique. So Elul talks about this in his book, where one technique begets another technique. Um, and because machine learning and whatnot, these sorts of things are now available, they created a thing called MCAS, uh, the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation Control System, um, to prevent the nose from pitching up in flight. To fix the stability issue, they introduced another technique to do this. But what happened was the angle of attack data was only being supplied from one sensor, and should that fail, sensor fail to produce the correct data, this thing would kick in at the wrong time and throw the plane into the ground, which happened in two cases, resulting in the death of 346 people. Um, through the, the analysis of this, uh, which again, this was provided to me by uh, the people at APEGA, um, the economic pressures associated with the projects, the economic pressures, caused um, inadequate safety hazard assessments to be done, poor design practices where basic principles were not respected, um, in particular around the single use of a sensor and a single data path, a, a inadequate testing and evaluation of the aircraft and the system associated with that, and then inadequate regulatory oversight. And of course, as Alol indicated, you cannot foresee all the outcomes of a technique. In this case, they did not foresee all the outcomes of the MCAS technique. Market demand creates business, or uh, business drove the decision to modify an existing design. Issues with the design resulted in MCAS technique. It was possible to concentrate, compensate the, for the stability issues with the MCAS uh, system. It was necessary because of the business drivers. The unforeseen consequence of MCAS were planes falling out of the sky under certain conditions. If it can be done, should it be done? So the next question I want to explore a bit is how far will I go to succeed? How far will I apply a technique to ensure success, to accomplish a goal? What trade-offs will you be willing to make? Which values will you decide are okay to overrule? Um, in the Boeing case, the decision was made to continue to move forward despite the known issues with the modified design. The business drivers were used to justify overruling the standard design practice and regulations. 
The leaders of Grenville did not start out with the intention of causing harm, quite the opposite. But over time, their technique became increasingly di disconnected from the, uh, the intent to do good. Um, and Alal talks about this, how the, the whole um, drive for technique overrides and comes to outgrow human control, even if we can govern the individual technologies at hand. Um, so how does the intent to do good become harmful to the application and justification of technique towards a goal? Take, for example, Google. Um, and this, since its inception, Google adopted the famous value statement, don't be evil. And it was at the heart of everything that they espoused to do. Uh, even going so far as embedding this into the 2004 IPO statement um, and also getting it into, you know, in, in cases this actually would happen where meetings would be known to stop because somebody would question the fact, uh, ask questions about what, what the organization was doing. Um, and I would just want you to pay attention to this, these two things here, unbiased and objectives that kind of Google's foundation was unbiased and objective search results and working to display advertising, which they label clearly and make relevant. But the thing is, is that the evilization, and I found that this is actually a word, I thought I was making a word, but it's apparently a word. Um, the evilization of a culture is a gradual process. This, the erosion of strongly held values doesn't happen immediately, it's a gradual s transition. A so, slow evolution of sacrificing, justifying, sacrificing, justifying values until you find yourself in a very different place from where you started. Uh, and the seeds of the eventual crisis that Google now finds itself in uh, were sown at the in point of Google's initial success. This is another really interesting book to read um, on this whole thing, and it goes into the Google case in a great, uh, a great amount of detail. Um, exceptional threats to the business, to Google's business, coming out of the, the, uh, the dot-com crash, um, awakened a survival instinct in the Google uh, culture. So Brennan Page has actually originally rejected advertising as being a business model because it didn't fit the don't be evil mantra. They were actually licensing their software to other organizations, but they weren't, they weren't making any money. The thing was failing. So what they did is they created this state of exception. Oh, it's okay for us to do advertising because we need to survive. So they brought in this technique uh, of AdWord, uh, the Google AdWords thing and all of that, um, as a means of dealing with the business issues. And of course, that took off right, like a rocket. And what business doesn't face this dilemma? You know, myself being in a startup, we're constantly looking at cash flow issues and challenges, and you know, you work through these things. And facing a decision of losing the business or uh, sacrificing a closely held value to close a deal is a really hard thing, a very tough choice to make. Um, But the thing is, is that one single compromise of don't be evil um, allowed this whole thing to kind of start to, to snowball forward to the point of where Google now finds itself in a place where they're dealing with se sexual harassment is issues, hate speech inside the organization, employees are staging mass walkouts, um, and this continues to evolve and move forward uh, to the point of where now Google is even starting to crack down uh, on its internal, normally, or traditionally, historically open uh, culture. Where, once you start sacrificing values, where do you stop? Last year, Google dropped the Don't Be Evil moniker. Uh, and, of course, just recently, Google has gotten to the point of where the, the, the CEO at Basecamp called this out. I don't know if you guys saw this one pop up, but it's quite interesting because now when you type in Basecamp, the first three things that come up are not Basecamp at all. Um, well, the first two things, it depends on the search, but, uh, and it, it's gotten to the point now where this idea of we display advertising, which we work hard to make relevant and we label it clearly, I can't read that little ad thing without my glasses on. <laughs> you know, that's, that to me is not clearly marked. Um, maybe it's just, maybe I'm looking at this the wrong way, but it strikes me that these values are no longer being, uh, no longer being honored. Um, because Basecamp now, as the CEO indicates, he has to pay money in order to get his thing ranked, up, his company's name ranked up the list. Um, how far will I go to follow a leader? And this is a really uh, interesting question. 
Um, and at Uber, of course, they faced this whole thing where uh, they used to feel like they were good people doing good things. Now they feel like they're bad people doing bad things. Um, and it is, it is this whole notion of uh, charismatic leadership that I experienced at, at Grenville. You, when you see this in action, it's, it's a really, um, it's kind of a hard thing to describe unless you kind of live through it in terms of how these sorts of leaders can create a state in which um, people are able to justify things that would, you would consider to be very inappropriate or, and so on in order to get to a place um, in order to accomplish the things that they're asking you to do. And it's very, very hard to stand up to them. Um, but my experience at Grenville does show the consequences and impacts of this gone ro rogue. Uh, and these are the things that I've observed sort of through studying this and seeing it. Uh, these are the kind of the key things, the key signals to look out for. If a leader becomes the sole keeper, judge, and jury of what is right at any kind of organization, this is not good. If the leader's vi vision transcends the duties society employs and customers, this is not good. If a leader is set up in a way that they become unassailable, Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook, for example, cannot be removed from the organization. Sergey and, uh, and Page and Brin cannot be removed from Google. Um, Father Farnsworth could not be removed from his leadership role at Grenville. It was impossible to, to, move, to remove that person or challenge them in any way. And the thing is, is that you know, none of these people start out with a desire to do bad things. Um, it's a vision to build great things. But there comes a point where the leaders themselves become so powerful, they, they lose sight of the impacts that they're having beyond uh, society at large. The pursuit of success above, above other, all other factors leads to a situation where values become secondary. And history also offers some pretty clear warnings about this as well, about pursuit of success above all else. Um, Thomas J. Watson, uh, this is the founder of IBM, is an example of a highly charismatic, successful technology innovator and leader. And so much so that they actually created a song, there's a song book, and you can download these things. I have an audio clip of it, but it's a bit fuzzy. Um, where they would actually sing up until 1995, apparently, they would, the employees would be required to sing this, this song in praise to the leadership of IBM. Um, now imagine, you know, people singing a song to Zuckerberg. I, <laughs> The, the rhyming scheme, anyway. <laughs> uh, Thomas Watson's single-minded business focus in pursuit of uh, a profit above all else was, made the company very, very successful. But it did lead him to personally approve and spearhead IBM's strategic technological relationship with the NDSAP in 1938, or 1933. And of course, the NDSAP... Oh, there's the song. <laughs> Uh, the NDC NDSAP was the Nazi party. Um, and this is all uh, documented in this book, also a very fascinating and terrifying read, um, where Watson saw an opportunity to work with the NDS NDSAP, the Nazi party, uh, to do the long overdue 1933 uh, German census. So they brought in the Hollerith machines, they set them all up, they set the punch cards and the codes and everything else. Um, they did the census. These machines uh, then were used to run uh, and, uh, the, and operate the concentration camps and identify people for those things, for the, for to be brought to those camps, and then they were used to manage the camps in terms of the final solution. Um, and IBM may not have realized uh, fully what it was doing at the time, but it's in, it, in its rush to exploit what it saw was a business opportunity uh, above and beyond any sort of consideration of values. Um, they ended up not only helping the Nazis identify Jews, but the equipment and software that it provided under contract to Hitler's government helped the Nazis operate the concentration camp system that was used in the final solution. And Watson was actually given an award uh, by Hitler at one point for his work. Um, How far will you follow a leader? At what point do you question their actions, their motivation? And this was an interesting statement as well. Um, there were no walk-offs or protests that could be found in the historical documentation about this at the time, even, even after more of the information came out about what was going on in Germany at the time. And the thing was, nobody questioned this uh, because of the leader ethos. And Edwin Black does talk about this in, in the book, where 
there are many similarities in terms of the, the leadership and the style of leadership and whatnot in today's technology companies. Now, the good news about all this is that unlike in the past, people are taking action and they are speaking out. So it is very hard to do, as I indicated. It can take a very long time. My classmates at Grenville started the lawsuit proceedings in 2008, and it's only just now that that is finally getting to court. But it is critical to speak out, otherwise nothing changes. And like I say, this is happening. Employees uh, at these organizations are speaking out. There's been walkouts at Google. There are people leaving Facebook, the founders of Instagram, the, the founders of WhatsApp have left Facebook and are now talking about this. Employees at these organizations are coming out and making statements. Uh, just this morning, I found this article about a software engineer, uh, Seth Var Vargo, um, who found out his code was being used on one of these ICE projects, uh, the identification projects in, in, that are going on in the US right now. Um, and he's pulled his code off GitHub. Amazon. Um, Amazon workers sent a letter. They banded together. They sent a letter to the leadership. And they say, and they literally call out the historical implications of the Hollerith machines being applied to the Nazi Germany case. Amazon's recognition system has been sold to the US government uh, to help identify um, people for deportation. So people are not OK with this. And they are talking, they are speaking out about it. Leadership doesn't always listen. I found this comment very interesting. You know, doesn't make any sense to me. Why would, you, why would you pull away from this? And then the statement, one of the jobs of the senior leadership team is to make the right decision, even when it's unpopular. So what is the right decision? Right decision for who? <laughs> you know, is this the right decision for the company, for the society, for Jeff Bezos? Does he need more money? I don't know. Um, I don't think so. <laughs> Maybe, anyway, I better not go there, but how far you, will you follow a leader if they make decisions that you don't feel comfortable with? So this starts with us, really what this boils down to. How do we address the culture crisis? As Achelle mentioned yesterday, it starts with us. It starts with employees and senior leaders at these organizations questioning um, what's going on, uh, asking tough questions about things. It starts by our seeking to understand and finding ways to factor ethics into our work. Um, you know, we're not asking these sorts of questions. If it can be done, should be done. How far will I go to succeed? How far am I willing to follow a leader? We need to accelerate humanity's ethical evolution and not start this process from scratch. So there are, we're not alone in facing these challenges as a discipline. Other disciplines have gone through this crisis. The medical discipline, of course. Hippocratic Oath. Um, the engineering discipline, of which I was originally trained in. Um, and I spoke to APEGA about this. APEGA is a regulatory body that oversees, one of the regula regulatory bodies that oversees the practices of professional engineers. Um, and they gave me, they provided me with this information to, to share with you, if you haven't seen this. How many people have seen the Engineering Code of Ethics before? Oh, quite a few, excellent, awesome. <laughs> uh, and you'll notice, and, and those of you who know about this, of course, will know about the, the, the focus on um, the engineer's role in providing society and people in society with uh, health and safety, focus on health and safety, welfare of public, uphold and enhance the honor and dig dignity and serve the public interest. Um, these are important things. And of course, they do teach an ethics course as part of the standard engineering curriculum. Uh, we also do the, the iron ring thing. So Canadian engineers uh, are wear this ring as a sharp reminder of the engineering ethics and our obligation to make things that are useful and safe. And this whole thing came out of uh, the Quebec Bridge disaster, um, in which it compromises in the design and the approach to building this particular bridge resulted in 75 uh, people being killed. And of course, there, these bodies do have enforcement ability. They can remove the, the, an individual who's violated these ethical standards they can remove them from practice. So these are the ways that the engineering uh, discipline has addressed the cultures of crisis that happened in the past. And there are lots of firms out there that are striving to do better. Um, and I thought this was great. You know, the t-shirt yesterday, I like that. It was really cool. Um, and this, this information about Netflix, they, they published this information up and uh, as I understand it, they really work hard to live to the, the, the ethical standards and the, the values that, they've, that they're espousing here. 
Um, but at the end of the day, it's up to us, each and every one of us. Ensuring what we do that, that is, what we do is done to the best of our technical skills is not enough. We also must make sure we, we th think about and reflect on what we choose to work on, who we choose to work for, and for how we treat those around us. We have to make sure that we're treating people in an ethical way. The fact is that we as uh, software developers have enormous power. Our talents are in demand. These organizations cannot function without us. Um, and it's our choice as to who we follow, what we do with our skills, how we design our systems. Um, and some of us may go on to start the next tech, tech unicorn. You know, we may end up being in the position that some of these people found themselves in. You know, and, and that's where I'm going to leave you with this, uh, this great uh, quote from my friends, the, uh, the Flaming Lips, um, who I had to, oh, what happened there? Oh, there we go. So yeah, with all, with all your power, what are you going to do? It's totally up to you. <laughs> How'd I do for time? Oh, good. Questions, comments, thoughts, snowballs, rocks? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. No, but that, that is a great question. So because, of course, uh, um, you know, when you look at a, co a corporation like Amazon, and it was interesting, to, that's why that I found that uh, situation with the, uh, the person who was developing the, that bit of open source software that was being used by a company to do the, the ICE stuff. And he's like, no, that's not OK. I'm pulling that. Um, you know, and we were talking a bit about that yesterday with the, the data, uh, the models used for training AIs and whatnot. Um, you know, it's, and it's not a clear-cut thing. Uh, have corporations done any better at this sort of thing? Uh, in a lot of cases, they haven't. <laughs> so maybe there is a way. Maybe, way, maybe more what it, what it should be is, um, you know, if somebody's looking to open source something like a self-driving car set of algorithms, maybe there needs to be some, something in there where a regulatory aspect where it's, well, it's not okay to test this out on an open highway. Maybe there needs to be something put in place where it has to go through some sort of a, a checkpoint or you know, standards body before it is actually released out. Because uh, that was the issue with the, um, um, oh, and I'm drawing a blank on it, <laughs> um, with the Boeing case, um, was they basically fast-tracked the thing through the whole process uh, and then didn't do adequate testing on, on the outcome. And the, the outcome was the, the system not being vetted in all appropriate conditions. And they were basically self-regulating. Yes, that's right. They were self-regulating. Would an alternative to regulation of the open source approach be that, uh, as an individual, if you take this other person's speech and apply it into a device that you control and you enable it, you're the one who's responsible for it? Well, that, so that's a really interesting question. Um, and I did have, so I've got, I've got like about, I don't even, probably about four or five hours of material in this thing. And I, I only have a fraction of it that I put up. Um, there was another part of this where I was going through the fact that in the software industry, um, the terms and conditions that we use for our work absolve us of any and all responsibility associated with the works that we produce. That's exactly the opposite thing what, from what happens in engineering, in which when you're doing an en engineering design, 
you're required to stamp and take responsibility and the liability associated with that work. So you're right. I think there's, and I've heard some lots of debates about this where um, if we bring in this aspect of personal responsibility and liability or organizational responsibility and li liability for software works, it would kill innovation. Um, and I think that notion was probably okay when there was a clearer delineation, again, between s systems that are uh, impacting public safety and systems that were not. Now I don't think it's quite that clear cut and it may be that we do need to start going down that path of looking at having more liability assigned to people <coughs> who create works. Um, I, I'm just on the, on the Boeing 737 thing, um, because they were you know, effectively self-regulating themselves. Um, you know, it was really, um, at a certain point, if you think about the, how they built that, it was down to the developer who actually wrote that code to, to really bring up what some of those problems are. And I, and, and I wonder what your thoughts are on, like, we look at a lot of these um, people who are success, uh, su successful, and we equate it to business wealth as opposed to somebody who stuck to their morals or stuck to their values and said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go make this billion dollars um, because I don't think it's the right thing to do. We don't seem to celebrate that type of decision. And so I wonder if that, that type of, um, or I, I wonder what your thoughts are on, on, on that type of cultural and how, how do we change that? That's it also fascinating. Um, yeah, because when you're in a situation like that, you're absolutely right. So. I, you, to use Grenville as an example, um, I knew going into that school that the religious ethos was not in alignment with the Anglican Church, and I had the the background, f you know, with my family and whatnot to challenge that. So I did. <laughs> that didn't go well. Um, so when you're in one of those situations, it can be incredibly hard to stand up, you know. And I'm very impressed with what's going on with, you know, people at these these other the various organizations who are now doing this. But you're right. The problem is, one of the big problems is, is that the business success is, uh, is celebrated above and beyond any of these other factors. Um, and I don't know if I have a really great answer for that in terms of how we might go about changing that. Again, it could come from us. So as people in this room, um, you know, as we become or go into leaderships, or if you are in a leadership position, maybe start bringing that sort of thing in. It's like, oh, this person made a hard choice. Let's celebrate that choice. You know, maybe it cost us some some aspect of uh, financial remuneration, um, but we, we have actually accomplished something greater than that. And actually the, the contact that uh, Matthew Oliver at APEGA uh, made an interesting statement to me about that. He said, you know, um, what ends up happening with a lot of these things is that um, you may have financial sec success in the short term, but eventually the consequences of these actions do catch up with organizations as they are with Google, as they are with Facebook, as they did with Uber. Um, and that was another case where that CEO was originally considered to be unassailable, but he was eventually pushed out. Um, so I think you're right. That's a really, uh, I should write that down. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so I have a background in software engineering from the UK. Yep. So we went through all the Apega practices. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Right. And uh, do you think maybe a natural evolution of that role could be companies start looking at software engineers, not just as developers, but as people that can be that signature, that viability at the end of the path? Yes, uh, I actually think that that would be an appropriate thing to start to look at. Um, you know, I think the, I think there should be an ethics course that's taught as a standard thing in computer science in using a similar pattern. And there should be a regulatory body, you know, whether that ends up being a PEGA or an equivalent or some other body that's similar in the software domain. Um, I think those things are probably, we're at a point now where I think those things are needed. Um, and then people should be taught about the standard of care that they have for society uh, and for the things that they produce. That will have an impact though on the cost of things, uh, um, is the issue. And of course, so far organizations haven't been willing to bear the cost of, of, of that. So. I think if society at large and people um, and, and companies, and again, Boeing, of course, and Matthew Oliver talked about this too, where it was um, Boeing is now facing a situation where you know, they, they chased after this business opportunity 
they're now facing a situation where they may end up being in serious trouble as an organization um, because they didn't live up to the practices that they, that they sh as they should have. So maybe it does cost more to test the plane. Maybe it takes longer. Maybe it takes a bit longer to get it to market. Um, but the consequences of taking those shortcuts are going to be massive. And, not, and not, you know, not to mention the fact that they killed hundreds of people as a result of shortcutting all of this. Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, and you're right, that was, as, as that was sort of pointed out in that, there's a, there's a couple of factors that played into it. Um, but the, you know, the organization itself, um, even before it got, when they were doing the early development of the aircraft, as I understand it, I don't know the case in super low detail, but um, as I understand it, the aircraft actually failed initial development tests. So one of the questions I would have for that in that case is why didn't they stop the development of the aircraft at that point as opposed to getting further in? Cost. Cost. Right. <laughs> of course. On a more subtle note, um, we can see platforms such as like um, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, they are um, trying to go and suddenly encourage you to use their platform more often or they do encourage you or they notice that if you have spending habits, um, they encourage you to buy even more and then be more, slightly more aggressive with their advertising campaigns, despite the fact that, like for example, there's health concerns for sitting in front of your computer, took you too long there, uh, or you can bring someone to financial ruin if you know that they're already spending irresponsibly. However, the business model more or less depends on people actually continuously using platforms in these ways. Do you have thoughts on whether or not this is an ethical practice and whether or not leaders should be responsible for kind of trying to stop such things? Yeah, that's another uh, great question. I'm actually, um, involved in a thing called the, the Effortless Society, which a, a colleague of ours, uh, Trent Gilliam, has started up that, that delves quite deeply into that, this whole idea of addiction-driven design um, and how basically you know, or some companies are using the same sorts of design patterns that would be used in slot machines um, and in casinos to try and trap people and direct their attention in. The, sur the book, The Surveillance Capitalism, actually talks about how um, uh, behavioral shaping methods, it's now gotten to the point of where uh, various organizations um, are actually using behavioral shaping techniques. They're no longer, um, you know, relying on people just to match them with the advertisements. They're actually bringing, I using, influencing people's behavior to, to keep them trapped in this cycle. Um, and in terms of the, the responsibility for that, yeah, so I think part of the issue there um, is the business model itself. Uh, is kind of at the heart of that. And it, and it was talked about a lot with the Google case where, um, you know, one small change begets another one, you override your values for one thing, and then all of a sudden you're now, you know, you've got all your users, you're trying to trap your users in this endless cycle. Um, we need to find business models that, and reward business models that don't go down that path. So I think it's kind of a bit of a, the companies that are there, like Facebook and Google and so on, I don't think they're going to have the ability to change themselves. I think we need to create new companies and new offerings and new opportunities for people to have the choice to go to other places. Consumers, though, have to be educated on some of this stuff, um, and they have to be also willing to pay for services that don't feature advertising. Um, so that's kind of why I like the Netflix model. You know, that, that is, I think, is an example of an organization that has succeeded in bringing a product to market that is not dependent on an advertising revenue stream and is instead subscriber-based. So the value is being derived from that in such a way that hey, I'm paying for this thing so I don't get ads. Um, and then I think the other thing that needs to happen there is there, you know, the antitrust stuff that's starting to ramp up. Um, the GDPR case, I think, in Europe is a really great mechanism. Um, and it has been interesting to see how, how that has changed the, the conversation in, in the European. Uh, and I imagine there's the people in Europe here can probably talk a bit better about this than I can, but... Uh, I can talk about it. Sorry, sorry, we're, 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 we're out of time. We're out of time. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for your attention and your time, and um, thank you, Todd, for inviting me. <laughs>